We're going to get going. If I could ask, please, you guys to keep your voices down, preferably silent this whole time, because I know you guys can't hear each other, but I can hear everything coming up to me. It makes it very distracting. All right, so I just told you everything else. If you got all your stuff up, if not, we're going to get started anyway. Um, so we're going to start with chapter one, as you can see up here. Now, chapter one, as I said on the here, in very plain terms, it's a bunch of definitions that you should at this point know very, very, very well. All of these words up on the screen, things we've covered so many times, you should know it like the back of your hands. Um, as we go through here, basic je definition genetics and some other definitions we don't care about. Um, and we've got some very basic definitions uh, again here. So DNA, double-stranded, helix of nucleic acids, base paired into, into nitrogenous bases of A and T and G and C. Uh, very, very simple stuff in this chapter, but these are all things you should know very well. Um, we have what we call the central dogma here. So it's kind of a picture, and what we're seeing is we have genetic information stored in the sequence of nucleotides that gets transcribed, and then it gets translated. That's the central dogma. So DNA exists to store information. We can transcribe it and then translate it to make products. In this case, in this picture, a polypeptide, a.k.a. a protein. Okay? And so we have another very uh, useful definition here. Uh, what is a gene? I've covered this a lot of times. A gene is a discrete unit of DNA. It's inheritable, and it codes for a functional product. Very useful definition there. So any gene makes some functional product. It could be protein. It could be RNA. All right? And genes are located on or in, however you want to think of it, a chromosome, being DNA. So what is a chromosome? A chromosome is a double helix molecule of DNA plus the proteins associated with it, which we cover later. Uh, it can, that structure, DNA and protein complex, is referred to as chromatin. Chromatin exists in different forms across eukaryotes and prokaryotes. So in prokaryotes, these simple single-celled organisms, they have one singular chromosome. Uh, it is circular. There's no nucleus for it to be contained in. And in eukaryotes, we have multiple chromosomes. They're not circles. They're rods. They're open at either end. Uh, gene loci. So a gene and a locus is not the exact same thing, though we might sometimes use those terms almost interchangeably. If a gene is a discrete region of DNA that codes for something, then its locus, or loci, plural, is the space, the physical exact space within a chromosome which that gene occupies. So across any bodies of, a, of the same species, chromosomes, the loci, the locus, will always have the exact same gene on it, though that gene may vary. So when we talk about a gene varying, we have alleles. They are different forms of the same gene. And we'll spend our whole first block here talking about alleles. So the same gene, through slight variation, can cause different phenotypes. It can cause different effects within an organism, and we'll talk about that. Uh, we can describe an organism's makeup of alleles in total as a genotype. So that is the specific listed out um, set of alleles that an organism carries. A genotype determines an individual's phenotype. So a genotype tells us what they have. A phenotype is how we see it displayed. Could be something like color, or it could be size, or some other physically observable trait. All right. And our last sort of bits of terminology, when speaking about alleles, we speak of organisms and their genotypes for whether they have the same alleles or different alleles. One can be homozygotic. If we have two or more copies of an allele and they're all the same, we have a couple different nomenclatures up top. So we have some dominants in capital letters. We have some recessives in lowercase. We have wild types with pluses, all sorts of things you guys have seen already. And if an organism's uh, complement of alleles, its genotype, has multiple different alleles of the same gene, it is a heterozygote. Heterozygote, hetero for difference. All right, we have a recessive allele. It is an allele that is not expressed in a heterozygote. It is an allele that is dominated and masked by the dominant allele. Um, so anytime you see a heterozygote, you will not see an expressed recessive allele. And we have the dominant allele. It does what it says on the label. It dominates the recessive, and it will be expressed over top of a recessive allele. Uh, wild type is the most commonly observed. 
Throughout most of this class, we've used it to describe a dominant. It is not always dominant, but for the most part, it will be. It is simply just the most commonly observed phenotype, what you would see in the wild. And then mutations, which we cover in depth in exam four's material, which will not be covered today. Um, any alterations to DNA leads to a change in a gene product or a gene's regulation. Um, that should all hopefully be still very fresh in your heads, having come from an exam not even a week ago on that material. All right. That is chapter one. If there are no questions being shouted out to me at this point, we're going to go straight into chapter two, chromosomes, cellular reproduction. So this is reaching way back, but hopefully some things you guys should be familiar with also through general biology, that kind of stuff. So some pictures and some other things that we care about. So the DNA of eukaryotic cells I just mentioned forms into a complex called chromatin made up of DNA and the histones and other proteins, primarily histones. Um, so we have, we can see here that we'll talk more in depth, the histones and the H1 protein that acts as a clip to bind them to that. Uh, again, we already said eukaryotes have multiple chromosomes, prokaryotes have single chromosomes. And then so prokaryotic cell division, very simple when we compare it to eukaryotes. Uh, if we remember the name of this uh, binary fission, doesn't actually say it up here, but that's what it's called. Uh, prokaryotes do not reproduce sexually. They simply clone themselves and split into daughter cells. So it's going to amount to what we'll see when we talk about mitosis, very similar. They copy their genetic material. They separate the copies of the material, and then they split the cell, as we can see in the picture. Eukaryotic cell reproduction is a lot more involved. We have two different methods that occur in somatic cells, soma for body. So in our non-reproductive uh, cells, uh, we reproduce, we divide by mitosis. Pretty much this process. Um, in sex cells or germ cells or gametic cells, whatever you want to call them, we have mitosis and we have meiosis, meiosis being a sexual reproductive uh, mechanism. So we produce gametes, eggs and sperms for germ cells. Eukaryotic cells, uh, as well as having two different forms of reproduction, uh, we are diploid, uh, humans specifically, which is mostly what we talk about in this class. Um, but any diploid organism has two copies of each chromosome. Uh, we, when an organism is diploid, we call the pairs of those chromosomes homologous. They're homologous chromosomes or homologs or homologous pairs, however you want to describe them. And they have the exact same linear sequence of genes, meaning they have all the same loci. However, those loci may have different alleles. Thus how we get variation in a single organism. So if a diploid is two, we can describe other forms of ploidy. A haploid cell has only one copy. A polyploid has more than two. We didn't really talk about that, so don't worry about it. But that is what we discuss when we mean ploidy. So eukaryotic chromosomes, a duplicated chromosome that has been duplicated during the cell cycle in the S phase, the synthesis phase, has two sister chromatids. They are linked together at the centromere. They carry exactly the same alleles because they are copies of the, each other. They're exactly the same. During cell division, they will separate and they will each become a chromosome. So you go from one duplicated chromosome of two sister chromatids to two individual chromosomes. Uh, again, so we have a centromere holding these, these two sister chromatids together. Uh, at the centromere. We have telomeres that cap the end of every eukaryotic chromosome to keep it from being degraded. And we have origins of replication, also called ori in prokaryotic cells, um, where synthesis begins. If we remember kind of jumping forward, uh, eukaryotes, because their chromosomes are so large, we have multiple origins of replication, thus the S on origins. They all start at the same time. Don't worry about that. Um, the brief look at the cell cycle. So throughout the entire life cycle of a cell, uh, we start with a newly divided, what we call a daughter cell, that has been split from two other cells, or from one uh, cell, rather. It goes through two phases of growth, sandwiched by DNA synthesis, and then there it's all wrapped up in interphase. And then after interphase, so growth one, DNA synthesis and growth two. Following that, if the cell decides to split, it will undergo division and then cytokinesis. So this shows exactly what I just said. 
This would be handy to know for the exam. Interphase, we have growth one or gap one. S for DNA synthesis, gap two or growth two, and then followed by possibly G0 if the cell never divides again, or if it is going to divide M phase for mitosis. We list out the phases of mitosis, which we'll jump into through here. That's a picture. So the very quick version of this, uh, we have an interphase, then we're going to move to prophase, what we're interested in. For the uh, 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 concerns of this course, prometaphase is wrapped up in prophase. There are only four stages that Dr. Baer considers testable. So in prophase, as we can see, we're condensing long unwound DNA, uh, what we would call euchromatin, that you should know as well, uh, condensing into these very, very tight uh, chromosomes that have this duplicated X shape, two sister chromatids each. That is prophase. In the next phase, why is telophase there? It goes backwards, it, goes backwards, it sure does. Uh, metaphase on your far right, uh, the next one, so P, we go to M, we have metaphase, they're lining up in the middle, uh, getting uh, ready to split. The, uh, Well, anyway, so they're lined up in the middle. Uh, the nuclei, that's it, have dissolved. Um, and the spindle fibers are grabbing onto the centromeres and getting ready to pull them apart. So if metaphase is preparing them, then an anaphase is when the sister chromatids are being pulled apart. They're split from each other. They're being pulled to the poles of this cell. And then the last si uh, uh, phase of mitosis, telophase, we have not two daughter cells yet, but we have a polarized cell that is beginning to pinch off in the middle. They're beginning to reform the nuclei, and we can see the beginnings of two cells. When we actually split these two, or this large cell into two daughter cells, we describe that as cytokinesis. So if you guys have heard that uh, acronym PMAT-C to describe these four, PMAT is mitosis, the C at the end is its own separate phase, it's cytokinesis. All right, so just another cover of the things I just discussed. That's that problem that I got asked a lot uh, about a lot and that elicited some riots in class. If you don't know how to do those, I suggest looking over them again, but we don't have time to do it right now. So if mitosis is asexual reproduction, we're splitting a cell into two identical clones of each other that we call daughter cells, then sexual reproduction would be meiosis, the other option. Um, meiosis is, for most purposes, two rounds of mitosis is, is pretty much how it works. Yes? So the number of phases of mitosis, would that be possible? Um, Absolutely could be possible. Um, there are free responses on this, so she could ask you to track that. You should be comfortable with, with tracking DNA molecules. It's all multiple choice. It's all multiple choice? Then there you go. So if she asks you something like this, it will be phrased in multiple choice, but you might be asked just to give an answer at the end. Okay. Did I see another hand in the back? OK, cool. So an overview of meiosis there. Hmm? Yes, pretty much. Everything that's in here, uh, I will answer through, through what I'm talking about, OK? So if we jump through it here, again, the phases, basically two phases of mito uh, mitosis, <laughs> slightly different. We have meiosis 1 with PMATC1 an interphase between them called interkinesis, and then meiosis two. Uh, only differences between the two, which is best explained by this graphic. So thinking of a diploid organism like ourselves, all of our cells have two copies of each chromosome. So we have 23, we have 46 total, 23 homologous pairs. In meiosis one, we want to split apart those homologous pairs. So you can see here, we have, let's call these chromosomes one and two, and we have two copies of chromosome one and chromosome two. Meiosis one, we will go through prophase, metaphase, anaphase, uh, and telophase, and then a round of cytokinesis at the end, producing a s two cells that each still have duplicated chromosomes, but are no longer in a homologous pair. They're not paired together. In meiosis two, we'll do basically mitosis, where each of those two cells will split apart the sister chromatids of the two chromosomes, producing four cells that each have a haploid number of chromosomes and they are not duplicated. It is one single chromosome, one chromatid, 
half the number that we started with. So we go from a diploid to a haploid producing gametes. These could be sperm or these could be eggs. It's the same thing. And so again, meiosis one, meiosis two. Still PMATC for each one. You can take a look through the stages. They're exactly the same. We just alternate from homologous pairs to the same process done with sister chromatids. Not going to get into all these pictures here. All right, another problem here, tracking this through meiosis. Again, if you, uh, if you can do this on your own, you should be comfortable with this. Uh, we are, we talk about this at length for exam three's material. So we can get variation in meiosis, not in mitosis, hopefully. Um, in meiosis, we can have recombination. Does what it says on the label. We are recombining the alleles and the genes uh, contained within multiple chromosomes. Uh, and the way that we know of doing this from this lecture is crossing over. So that's covered more in depth later, and I'll skip it. Um, it does not create any new variation. It simply shuffles around the alleles between homologous chromosomes. Recombination. That's an example. Are crossing over again? So we'll get more into it later, but crossing over shows it here. So crossing over occurs when two chromatids of the homologous pair of chromosomes are lined up and are very close to each other. So when we have all of these lined up is in uh, metaphase, end of metaphase, early anaphase before they're pulled apart. They're very, very close to each other, the two central chromatids. And as you can see here, they can kind of touch each other, flip-flop identical regions of, uh, of uh, each chromosome. So they end up with the same loci, but possibly different alleles if the chromosomes had different alleles. That wasn't a hand? If she says prophase, then it's prophase. Yeah. Go with her. So Always go with what she says. In the PowerPoint on our first test, it was crossing over to take place prophase one with yeah. prophase one. Like there, it looks like it takes place prophase one according to that. Yes, if it's saying prophase, then do it. This study I was written by me, I'm not infallible. So anytime she contradicts me, she's right. Okay? So then, correction, it's prophase one. There you go. All right, independent assortment, uh, that will be covered more in these next couple chapters. But an independent assortment, that is telling us that the homologous pairs orient randomly along a plate. So they kind of track these things with blues and reds if we go up a couple slides. Um, if we jump back here. And so each homologous pair has a blue and a red. Those blue and the red may split separately from each other. So the two are not tied together. They don't pass on a certain way. The two daughter cells from meiosis one have a random assortment of one of the two chromosomes from each homologous pair. That's independent assortment. Same concept for the, when we split the sister chromatids apart, they will also be split randomly. So each of the new four daughter cells at the end of meiosis two will have a random assortment of sister chromatids, but they will only have one from each homologous pair. That'll be covered more later. Independent assortment, again, shows them randomly assorting. Uh, this is probably too in depth for what we're doing, but put very simply, cohesin does what it suggests. It coheres two chromatids together um, until it's time for it to be broken down so we can split them. That's what holds them together. Not gonna talk too much about that. Same thing here. Uh, gaminogenesis, don't worry about it. And then there's some homework problems. If there's no questions, I'm jumping straight into chapter three. No, fantastic, 749. So the fun part, heredity, going through Mendel and all this stuff, we don't, well, we care about him, but we don't care about his, his history. We don't care about garden peas. So we already talked about genotypes and phenotypes. Um, a monohybrid experiment, so that's the basis of this whole first half of the course of inheritance genetics. So we have a monohybrid. Uh, we're looking at one single trait, aka one single gene or loci that has multiple alleles, possibly. Um, and so in a monohybrid experiment, we take what he called true breeders. 
um, aka homozygotes. One is homozygotic for a dominant allele, one is homozygotic for a recessive allele. So we have those as a parent, one's homozygous dominant, one's homozygous recessive. We cross them and we see certain things happening. So in the F1, the first generation, uh, filial one, we have all of them looking the same. And we know why that is, but we'll talk about it in a minute. And then if we take two F1 offspring and cross them together, we see this characteristic thing that's the whole basis of this, which is a three to one ratio, wherein we see three with a dominant phenotype, one with a recessive phenotype. And we'll talk about why that is. Don't worry about that uh, or that. This is all stuff we know. More stuff you don't need to know. All right, so we did just mention this earlier, but I want to tie it in again, and it's mentioned a third time later. But when alleles separate, they're passed on with equal probability. So again, it's very important to remember independent assortment until we get to the point where we don't have an independent assortment. So alleles, unless stated or seen otherwise, pass on randomly from each other. They assort independently. That is called, it's up at the top here, uh, the law of segregation. So the law of segregation is one of Mendel's ideas, says again that uh, alleles assort randomly from each other. All right, the way we work this whole thing is Punnett squares. You've probably done a thousand of them. Uh, they're extremely handy. You'll end up doing some more on this exam. Uh, it's very likely uh, you're simply listing on one column to the far left the alleles of one parent that you pick doesn't matter. And then on the row at the top, you're listing the alleles of the other parents. And when you add them together in each cell, you get the phenotype or the genotypes rather of their offspring. So I'm sure we've all done these before. All right, more Punnett squares, uh, back crosses, don't worry about them. Test crosses, don't worry about them. Uh, there is a second way of doing this whole thing if you don't want to go through Punnett squares. I'm not going to cover it. Uh, because most people that have ever been in my sessions don't use it. So that takes up a lot of time. But if you don't like Punnett squares and you prefer to use the rules of st uh, statistics and uh, or probability rather with multiplication and addition, you can use that. I'm just not going to talk about it today. Okay. The standard characters uh, and symbols that you should know, hopefully again, like the back of your hands. We have dominance with capital letters. We have recessive with lowercase letters. And then sometimes you'll see the wild type, which is designated with a plus, either a plus all on its own, or a plus as a superscript next to the letters used to describe it. So you could see all of those things. You should be very familiar with all four of those different types of nomenclature. Okay, Dihybrid cross uh, gets us into a little bit deeper of a layer, sort of like a monohybrid, except instead of tracking one gene, such as round or wrinkled green peas, we're tracking two. So in this case, as an example, we could be tracking the shape of the pea as well as its color. So it brings us back to principle of independent assortment, um, which is to say that the genes, the alleles for shape and for color, unless we have some reason to believe they're linked, which is covered later, they will assort independently of each other as they are on different chromosomes. He doesn't say it here, but alleles at different loci, they assort independently. So the allele that this P possess, uh, possesses for shape does not influence its allele that it possesses for color, and it doesn't influence each other when they pass them to their offspring. They will assort independently of each other. We can solve problems like these using a big 16 cell Punnett square which is the way I've always done it. Again, you can use multiplication and addition of probabilities to get you there. Um, we tend to see this 9 to 3 to 3 to 1 ratio. You can memorize that if you like, but you should be able to work these out from scratch on a Punnett square if presented the type of problem. That's rules of probability, again, that I'm not getting into. You can also break it into two dihybrid crosses. Um, and then add the Punnett squares together or do it in a flow chart like this, not going to cover it. And that's the end of chapter three. No questions. Yes? A little louder, please.
Okay, so just like I said a second ago, when we cross the parents, we get four identical plants in the F1. Uh, when we cross two F1s, they're all going to be heterozygotes. And when we cross heterozygotes together, we see a three to one phenotypic ratio. We'll see a different genotypic ratio. But in the phenotypes, three will be dominant, one will be recessive, phenotypically. Any others? We're good. Okay. Come on now. Four. Now we get into the fun stuff, stuff that's probably going to be a little bit more rusty, at least up until you started studying, because I know you all have been studying. So we get into sex determination, sex link characters. Uh, we have two types of chromosomes. We have sex chromosomes, X and Y. In humans, there are other examples. And then we have everything else, and we call them autosomes. They're simply not sex chromosomes. OK. Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. This is telling you they're not true homologs, but they still pair up with each other. X and a Y, they look different. They stay with each other. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about the fish and, and changing uh, biological sex. Some organisms have different assortments. So we're used to XY. There is mostly bugs. The male can be an XO, the O standing for no chromosome. So if you see that on an exam, an XO uh, sexual genotype means they only have one X. They are male. And then there is a ZZ, ZW, which is covered in here. I'll, I'll go over briefly with chickens. Uh, but it's flipped. So in humans, the XX, uh, the uh, homogametic sex, is the female. In chickens, the heterogametic sex, the ZW, is female. And the males are ZZ. A little bit flipped around with some different letters. So covered again here. Heterogametic, we have two different ones. Anytime you see hetero, you're thinking different. XO, XY, ZW, homogametic XX, um, or ZZ. Some catch-all terms there. We're not going to go into them. You can still solve these with Punnett squares. There's the chicken again. Uh, probably way more than you need to know for tests. So honestly, just skip over it. We're not going to worry about genic or environmental sex determinations. Uh, briefly covered, because there are a few questions about it in those clicker question uh, at the end of Tuesday. Uh, she did ask a question about SRY. I very much don't think you need to know it, but it was in the clickers. So X SRY is a specific gene on the Y chromosome, sex determining region Y, and it pretty much determines a male phenotype. Uh, so if something happens to the SRY gene, all the rest of the genes on the Y chromosome don't do anything. You have to activate SRY first, and so it's kind of called like the maleness gene or the male gene. That kickstarts male development. Whereas otherwise, barring anything like activation of SRY, uh, male uh, 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 fetuses will develop as female, regardless of their XY. Uh, we can get aneuploidy events, abnormal numbers of sex chromosomes due to non-disjunction. So if we think back to uh, meiosis, when we're doing this, maybe in meiosis one, a homologous pair doesn't separate. Uh, or maybe in meiosis two, the sister chromatids don't separate. So we can end up with multiple copies of an X, multiple copies of a Y, which lead to some things, which again, she asked clicker questions about. They're probably worth knowing. A triplo X female also could be four or five Xs. Uh, pretty common. So we get a non-disjunction event somewhere in meiosis. There's an aneuploidy here. In this case, in triplo X, it's a triploidy, three copies of the same chromosome. They have three Xs instead of two. It's pretty much benign. It really does nothing. Four or five can cause some uh, intellectual disabilities. Kleinfelters. Uh, that is a male who has two X's, so it is XXY, or any other combination of X's and Y's, um, as long as there's at least one Y there. So there's still been a non-disjunction where it, there is a male who has more than one X. Uh, they are sterile. They are not developmentally delayed. Um, and otherwise uh, present uh, phenotypically as a male. And then Turner syndrome. So unlike bugs, where males are XO and that's fine, in humans, uh, XO is not all right. Um, in Turner syndrome, you, they are uh, considered female individuals with only one X chromosome. Uh, they did not inherit a second sex chromosome of any sort. Uh, they are also sterile. 
um, normal intelligence. It can often be lethal, the XO, and a YO is always lethal. Humans cannot live with just a Y. There has to be an X in there somewhere. Okay? XYY, the last one, uh, they used to be called like super males in the 90s. Uh, does what it says on the label. More than one Y chromosome, they're males, and they're pretty much normal. Risk of personality disorders. All right, there's a summary that we don't need to do. More stuff about all this we don't need to worry about. So, sex-linked genes. Uh, that is to say, if it is a sex-linked gene, the locus for that gene is on a sex chromosome. Whether it be X or Y, it is located on a sex chromosome. So we call it X-linked or Y-linked. We don't worry about the term holandric. She's not going to use it. So, and one last part here. If a gene is X-linked, it is located on the X chromosome, then any male could only ever be hemizygous for that allele, for that gene. They either have, an, have one allele, but they don't have a second X to give it a complement, so they're hemizygous, hemi for half, or they don't have that allele and they're not, they don't have any copies of it at all. And that's X-linked. Males are hemizygous for X-linked genes. There's a guy we don't really need to know about. Uh, we use the same symbols for this kind of stuff, except they're going to be superscripts to an X. So anytime you'll see an X linked, you'll have a big X and then a capital or a lowercase or a plus or you know a letter with a plus and you'll have a double superscript. But it's the same thing, it's just a superscript to the X. That's a problem we won't get into. More problems we don't get into. All right, so we get particular inheritance patterns, which we'll cover more in uh, the inheritance chapter, which talks all about this kind of stuff. Uh, we'll talk more about it then. But if a, a character is X-linked, then a father can never pass it to his son because a father passes his Y to his son. So any X-linked trait that a son has has come from his mother. Um, and any X-linked character a daughter has could come from either the mother or the father. But that's the basics of it. Dosage compensation, we talked more about that for exam three, um, X inactivation. So trisomies of the X chromosome can cause some slight problems because you have three copies. Why is having two copies of an X not a problem? Um, it's because one is deactivated, inactivated, for the most part, doesn't get expressed at all. So females uh, turn off one of their two X chromosomes at random. Males do not because they only have one X. So it's talked about here. We covered it in a bit more detail, but the basics of it being one X is randomly inactivated. It remains condensed for the rest of the cell's lifetime forever. That inactivation is passed on to its daughter cells, and we call that inactivated X a bar body. Um, just another picture of that stuff, more stuff. Uh, we get the tortoise shell cats. That's an example she's used actually on a test. Uh, and what happens there is X inactivation does not occur until rather late in the process. So here we see a cell in an early embryo that's its daughter cells. One has turned off XP, the other has turned off XM. And because this was very early in development, those cells go on to create millions and millions and millions of lineages of cells all of which inherit its inactivation pattern. So a lot of those have a black allele for fur color, and a lot of them have an orange allele. So you get females with a tortoise shell pattern. Some of those patches of cells have inactivated uh, X chromosomes with an orange gene. Some have inactivated X chromosomes with a black gene. We see it in humans. We don't care about that. Uh, y inheritance, because males always pass their Y chromosome to their sons. Every body in a lineage from a father somewhere along the line with a Y-linked uh, gene will have that trait unless they marry in and then it dies with that uh, generation. Y-linked. We don't talk about it a lot. Any questions here? Yes. Pardon, so about the bar body? Yeah, like remember 
uh, that doesn't really necessarily relate to a bar body. So only females have a bar body. Let's jump back here. Yes, so this was getting into that same example with the fish. I think it's probably a bit more than you need to get into for this exam. Uh, what it basically boils down to is in some species, not humans, uh, environmental factors can determine sex. So in a lot of coral fishes, they're all females or all male except for the dominant one, uh, which is a male or a female, and they can change biological sex. Or in turtle eggs, some turtle species eggs are determined to be male or female based on the temperature of the water when they were laid. That's all that environmental sex determination means, is somehow the environment affects whether the offspring becomes a male or a female. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Going into chapter four. No, or chapter five, rather. Then let's get into it. All right, so if that was all the basics of Mendelian inheritance, this goes into some more stuff here. So we start off with that idea of dominance being always masking a recessive trait, and that's kind of its definition. It's not always true. So we have a couple different types of dominance. Men, what I like to call Mendelian or complete dominance, everything up to this point was complete dominance. So whatever the dominant allele is, if it's there, that's what will be expressed. It will be expressed 100%. So if we have a dominant purple, a recessive white, any flower that has at least one copy of a dominant will always be purple. You have to have two recessive um, alleles to see the recessive phenotype. That's complete dominance. Incomplete dominance. Uh, heterozygotes who have a dominant and a recessive show a mixed kind of phenotype. So here we have eggplants. This is what actually happens with eggplants. Recessive white, dominant purple. Heterozygotes have a light purple or a violet color. It's incomplete because the recessive isn't totally masked. They blend together. We don't care about that. Not to be confused with codominance. So in codominance, there isn't, or maybe there is a recessive allele, but there are multiple dominant alleles. So those multiple dominant alleles have to share with each other because they're both dominant, they can't mask each other. So we did discuss the MN blood group here. Um, that's a better example is the ABO, our human blood type, besides this other one. So A and B are both dominant. If you have an A allele and a B allele, you have co-dominance of an AB phenotype. Uh, there's also a recessive allele with an O, and that's masked. Co-dominance. More pictures of co-dominance. And then penetrance and expressivity. Uh, in penetrance, it can be variable sometimes. So in a, a, a variable penetrance situation is when individuals that have a genotype, uh, whether they do or do not express that as a phenotype. So maybe one of these organisms inherits the genotype to have a purple color, but it turns out white anyway. That trait could be variably penetrable. It could be incomplete penetrance. It doesn't show the phenotype sometimes, even though it has the right genotype. And then expressivity is when all of them are going to show the phenotype for a given genotype, but to different amounts. So they're all still going to be purple if they have the purple genotype, but they may be lighter or darker purple. They may show less expression of that genotype as a phenotype. And then the bottom row here shows you that we can have both variable penetrance and expressivity going on at the same time. We can skip that, and that, and that, all of this stuff. And then the last part here is epistatic genes, described as the black, chocolate, and white labs. An epistatic gene is simply one gene that masks the expression of another gene. So the other gene could be a dominant or recessive situation. We could have a dominant color for black, a recessive color for brown, and then an epistatic gene which causes uh, a yellow phenotype. It's masking the, the black or brown color and instead uh, completely negating any expression of color in those animals. Uh, so the epistatic gene, the recessive E, if it's expressed, you get a white or a yellow lab, however you want to call it. 
because the gene for black or brown has been completely masked. It's been turned off by the epistatic gene. That's one example, but anytime you have an epistatic gene, it's able to mask a completely separate gene at a different locus altogether. They both have their own alleles. Links back into that stuff, which we don't care about. Uh, so getting into the last portion of this, we get sex-linked inheritance patterns. Uh, there are two big ones and then a couple minor ones. So sex-influenced. So we just talked about variable penetrance, meaning whether or not the genotype causes its corresponding phenotype. We can have a sex-influenced trait where we have an autosomal trait, so it's not on the X or Y, but it still has higher penetrance in one sex or the other. So if you take a male and a female of the same species, or let's say a bunch of males and females of the same species that all have the exact same genotype on an autosome, then a sexed influence trait, the males or the females might express that phenotype one more than the other as a trend. We see that with beards and goats. I don't think you need to know that example, but it's there. The males show beards more often than the females, even though they have the same exact genotype. Sex limited, so if sex influence is more or less penetrance in one sex over the other, sex limited is penetrance only in one sex and never in the other. So uh, in chickens here, cock feathering versus hen feathering, the male chickens for a recessive genotype can exhibit these long tail feathers, whereas the female chickens, the hens, even though they have the same genotype, will never ever have that feather pattern. It's a sex-limited trait to only males. Cytoplasmic inheritance and genetic maternal effect are in there. Um, I am not covering those. I think that's more fine detail than she's going to go into. Did we have any more questions? Yes, so for those who didn't hear, she was asking for clarification on epistatics. And so what you said was right. So we have an epistatic gene E that if it is doubly recessive, if it's homozygotic recessive, it causes albinism. So the yellow or white lab is actually an albino dog, and that recessive E, the epistatic gene, completely masks expression of the B gene. Both, genes, uh, both alleles for B cause color. So regardless of the uh, genotype of the B allele, a, a homozygotic recessive E, an epistatic allele, will completely make that dog albino. So do you have to know the genotype of the fashion? No, so in the case of an epistatic gene, you would know the epistatic effect would mask the effect of the other gene. So it could be anything for the other gene, and if we mask that effect, it's due to an epistatic. So a question you could see like this would tell you there's a gene with two alleles that do this and this, but we actually see this third phenotype that's neither of those. And so it could be an epistatic situation. Is the epistatic gene Not always. This is just an example. But an epistatic gene will have multiple alleles of its own, where one combination will be functioning and the other combination won't function. Yes, when it's a, when it's a homozygotic, uh, it will mask the other gene at a completely separate loci, mm -hmm. even if it's recessive. Yep. All right, any more questions? Cool. Then we're going into chapter six. All right, so this is pretty much the culmination, this and chapter seven, of all of this stuff that comes before. So if there's really anything that you should really know Coming up for this final, it's all encapsulated here in pedigree analysis and the next chapter in linkage and recombination. These are going to take everything that's been covered so far and kind of put it all into one big group of problems. So when you look at pedigrees, we're tracking how alleles are passed on through a family and through their generations. And to understand this, you, you have to really know everything else up to this point. So stuff we don't need to know, that tells you again what a pedigree is, some symbols, which boils down to two important ones. Person who has the trait is going to be colored in. A person who doesn't won't have color. Males are squares. 
females or circles. That's it. The rest of them she never used and outright told you you don't need to worry about. Just those. Uh, this shows you how they, they pass on. Hopefully we should know these. A couple who has children will be linked by a line and then those children will be shown dropping down into a new generation and all linked to the parents. Uh, don't worry about adoption. Twins are linked by a little Y shape there. And then co-sanguinity, if, uh, if we've got inbreeding, uh, we will see them linked by a double line. So the five inheritance patterns that you should be very confident with um, up above. So as she, you can see here, we, yes, we learned about codominance and all that stuff. If she asks you a pedigree problem, you won't worry about that. You will always be using full penetrance, full expressivity, and a complete dominant situation. It will be made as easy as possible. Okay? So we have these five patterns, and they all have their uh, characteristic traits that allow you to find out which one is which. So we have an autosomal recessive. Autosomal, we're not on a sex chromosome. Males and females will acquire these uh, 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 traits, these alleles, equal to each other. And then a recessive trait can and generally does skip generations. Uh, an individual can, have, uh, can be heterozygotic. They can have a dominant and a recessive allele, and we may call them a carrier, hopefully a term you guys remember. And so that carrier can pass the allele, and if the parents were both carriers in an autosomal situation, then some of the children may have a recessive trait. They may come out as homozygotic recessive. So the hallmark traits of autosomal recessive, again, males and females inherit these equally, likely to each other, and it can skip generations. Autosomal dominance. So we know if a dominant is always expressed over recessive, there cannot be carriers. If you get even one copy of it, you will express that allele. So uh, any dominant uh, 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 trait, whether it be autosomal or X-linked, does not skip generations ever. If you see a skip generation, you are not looking at autosomal or any dominant situation. Um, autosomal, again, males and females equally likely to inherit the trait. X-linked recessive. So we get the same recessive trend of being able to skip generations. Those dots show carriers. She won't use those on the exam, as she said above, not to worry about these. But it's just indicating that some are carriers, and thus they can pass that on to a son. Now, the reason that son got that is because males, as we said a few chapters ago, are hemizygous. So if it's an X-linked trait, a male only has one X. So a male who happens to get the affected, the recessive X chromosome from their mother, will get that trait, wherein a female would not. So males are more likely to have X-linked recessive traits because they only require one copy of an X, uh, X allele. They only have one X. And then again, they can skip generations. That's an example. X-linked dominant are going to be more likely to be seen uh, uh, from daughters from an affected father. It's only going to be seen, actually, in daughters from an affected father, as uh, fathers always pass the Y to their sons. So sons of an affected father can never inherit an X-linked dominant trait carried on their father's chromosome. Uh, and then affected females will pass, again, equally likely to their daughters or their sons because in either instance, only one allele is needed. So you won't see more sons uh, than daughters having this unless it's from an affected father. And you'll see the characteristic pattern of only affected daughters and never affected sons. So it's a little bit harder to spot, but it's there. Uh, in general, it's equal, but if you have an affected father, only daughters will get the trait. So fathers always pass their X to their daughters and their Y to their son. It's an X-linked trait, so the gene is located on the X, so their sons can't inherit it from their father. Now, if both mother and father are affected, then everyone's going to get it. But that's the specific situation you'll look for to determine X-link dominance, is you'll look for the fathers and see how they pass it to their sons and to their daughters. 
And then y length is the easiest one to spot. Very simple. If you get this on a test, be happy because you'll see every single male in a lineage that's not married in will have this. So you can see the married in individuals. Uh, the males do not. And everyone that comes directly from the original uh, affected male will inherit this. And that's y length. Uh, it will only be males. It will obviously never be women. There's some hints down here, but it's going to be just a list of everything I said. So this puts it in a nice list form. And that's it. Do we have questions about pedigrees and inheritance? Cool. We're rolling right along. So linkage. If pedigrees were one half of kind of the culmination of, of the first half of the course, linkage is the other one. So what we've been working with uh, so far is genes that are located on completely different chromosomes that pass independently of each other uh, according to the law of segregation and the principles of independent assortment, which we covered earlier. Uh, what can also happen is we can have linked genes. That simply means what it says up here in big letters. They're located on the same chromosome. So the loci for these genes are on the same chromosome. Since we know in meiosis and mitosis that sister chromatids split apart and each become a chromosome of themselves, if the gene loci are on the same chromosome, there's no way that they can split unless recombination happens. So otherwise, they will always pass on with each other. So if we go back to the P's, if the allele or if the gene loci for shape and color were linked, if they were on the same chromosome, Mendel never would have gotten anywhere because he wouldn't have seen the inheritance patterns that made any sense you would have had the alleles for shape and color being passed on with each other in most instances. So some definitions. We just talked about linkage. We already spoke about crossing over as a form of recombination. So recombination being the process that puts new allele combinations into offspring. And the example that we know of is crossing over. So that shows independent assortment, which we've talked about. That shows crossing over again. More in depth on crossing over. Important thing to remember here, if we look at the bottom half of this, B, uh, we have four total uh, chromatids within a pair, a homologous pair. Only two of those chromatids can cross over with each other, and it's the two that are in the middle and are physically very, very close. The two on the outside are not close to anything. They can't do any crossing over. They're too far apart. So the two in the middle can become recombinant, may, they don't always. But in any instance, if we experience recombination, because only two out of four chromatids can recombine, the most recombination we will ever see in linked genes is 50%. Two out of four chromatids experiencing crossover. That's an important thing to remember. So what this kind of gets us to is the test crosses. And what test crosses can allow us to do is one of two things that both come from the same calculations. We can measure the distance between the two or more linked genes. We can physically measure how far apart they are relative to each other on the chromosome. And we can know that because the more recombination occurs, the farther apart they are from each other. For recombination to be more frequent, there's got to be more space and more opportunities for crossing over to occur specifically in the region between those two genes that we're examining. Distance we can express uh, as also uh, being called recombination frequency. This big white box here is extremely important. Um, and I would say 100% you have to know that for this final. We know that 1% recombination is equal to one MAP unit. I don't think she ever used the term centimorgan, but it wouldn't hurt to know. So if we do one of these calculations coming up in the next slide, and she asks for MAP distance, then she's looking for MAP units. However, if she's asking for percent recombination, it's the same thing. 1% recombination is one MAP unit. Okay. So this is telling us we have a test cross. And you don't need to memorize this because she'll tell you it's always going to be a heterozygote and then a homozygous recessive. So bah, 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 bah. too much. Don't worry about this stuff. OK, so the problems you guys would be looking at, we're going to have linkage, and we're going to have some crossing over. 
So I said earlier the most crossover you'll ever get in linked genes is 50%. If those genes are so close to each other that there's no recombination possible between them, you could get 0%. However, the questions you'll be doing are going to be uh, somewhere in the middle. There will be some recombination um, because if she gave you a complete linkage or a 50% linkage, it would be indistinguishable from just regular inheritance. She wanted to ask you something like that. Um, and that says exactly what I said. And we get into these kind of examples here. So I'm not going to give you these examples, but I did pretty much uh, list off in your study guide, if you've got that up in front of you, the steps on how to accomplish one of these. You should be able to do these confidently in test two. She didn't ask you to do one as free response, but she asked you about six multiple choice questions on it. It was a big part. I can only imagine it's going to be a big part in this final. So in this instance, we have a two-point test cross. You should be able to recognize the steps. First being, um, you're looking for uh, the non-recombinant offspring. So if recombinant offspring have shuffled their alleles, then if they're non-recombinant, they haven't shuffled anything. They look exactly like their parents, genotypically and phenotypically. They're easy to identify because your parent genotypes will be listed, or in this instance, they might give you the genotype and the phenotype. And then you can find of the four types of offspring, two types will have the same phenotypes or genotypes as their parents. Those are non-recombinant. There are only two other types of offspring, and so they have to be the recombinants. And it's simple from there, and it's spelled out for you on the slides here. So we've got our, non -rec or we've got our recombinant offspring. We add those together. We take the total of all of our offspring, non-recombinants and recombinants, and we divide that uh, into the number of recombinants. And what that tells us is recombination frequency. And it tells us that because we're looking at the frequency of crossing over. We know that crossing over occurred in every single recombinant offspring. Every offspring had the opportunity to recombine. So we take the total number, ergo the number of opportunities for recombination, and we take the recombinants as the actual amount of times recombination happened. And what we get is the frequency of recombination, 21.8% in this instance, which could also be expressed as 21.8 MAP units, because we know 1% recombination is equal to 1 MAP unit. That easy. If we get into a deeper kind of layer here, we can go into three-point test crosses. We're tracking three genes. And this brings into, uh, into uh, focus the double crossover event. So a double crossover, exactly what it says. We have crossing over happening twice in the same cell division cycle. Uh, and specifically, we track this between three genes when crossing over happens in two separate locations, between gene A and B, and then again between genes B and C. And we care about that because if a double crossover happens twice between the same two genes, it's like it never happened. We would swap everything downstream, and then we'd swap it again. We would see no change. It could happen, but we have no way of knowing if it happened. But if it happens at two separate locations, we get what we see up top. We swap everything between uh, gene A and B, so we swap genes B and C. And then we have another crossover between genes B and C that swaps gene C back to where it was originally. And the effect is that genes A and C are where they were to begin with, but the middle gene, gene B, has been swapped. And that we can find, we can easily pinpoint it in a three-point test cross. And we'll see that incorporating into an example here. It is possible that when she leads you into a three-point test cross, she might give you something like this. In fact, you'll have to see something like this. And she might give you these in the wrong order. And we'll see how that works out. Uh, so what you'll see is a heterozygotic parent and then a homozygotic recessive parent. And you'll see the gene loci listed out in order that may or may not be accurate. We approach this the same way we approach a two-point test cross. We're going to identify the non-recombinant offspring. It's the same thing. They're the ones that look and have the same genotype as their parents. In this instance, they're the two up top. Non-recombinants are also going to be the most frequent. They will always be the most frequent offspring in a three-point test cross. So you can find them in one of two ways. 
We then have to identify the double crossovers. It's really easy. They're the two least frequent. They will always be the least frequent. So in this case, we have five and three, very obviously less in number than everything else. And what those will tell us, we just established that in a double crossover, the middle gene is swapped. In this case, we see the gene that's been swapped is SS, but it's not in the middle. So she might trick you a little bit like that. So you would have to situate it so the double crossover gene is actually in the middle. And she says that here, and then she fixes it in the next slide. So it's a little small. You guys probably can't see it. But you would just rearrange it to be in the middle and then work out the rest of the problem. So you've identified non-recombinants. You've identified the double crossovers. We have four offspring categories left, and they would be the single crossovers. You can link those together in pairs based on which gene was swapped. So you would see uh, characteristic uh, swappage for the, the pairs that came from the same crossover event. So if you look at the individuals 50 and 52, one of our parents was heterozygotic, uh, heterozygotic dominant. It had three dominant copies of every allele. And in this case, we have one dominant and two recessives. The one right below it has uh, two dominants, one recessive. They came from the same single crossover with each other, um, the 50 and the 52. So they came from a crossover between genes ST and SS that caused flipping of the latter two genes. They're paired together, which leaves only the other two left, and they must be in a pair with each other. That's important because when we solve this, we'll get two gene distances and two recombination frequencies. We'll do a two-point test cross, kind of mathematics, where we'll take the number of recombinant offspring from one pair, add it together with the double crossovers. In this instance, we have at the top the crossing over, the single crossover between ST and SS, the first two genes. The number of single crossovers added to 102. Eight is the number of double crossovers, and that comes to 110. Crossing over between SS and E, we had 84 single crossovers, eight double crossovers, we got 92. We would divide both of those, just like before, by the total number of offspring, and what we get is two figures. We get the, di the genes uh, distance between ST and SS. We also get the distance between SS and E. They're three separate genes with distances, two different distances between. You can add those together and get the total distance from the first and the last genes, which is just the sum of the two, which is the one that's on the bottom. So the distance from ST, the first, to E, the last. So same kind of mathematics, a little bit more involved with double crossovers. But this is definitely, I can guarantee you, something that you're going to get tested on because, again, it requires all of the knowledge for the entire first half of the course. OK? And that's the rest of it. Do we have questions about linkage, about calculating map distance, recombination frequency? Yes? Repeat it all in a different way. All right. Pardon? Coincidence and interference? From where? Where are you seeing that? Uh, that is not something she covered. There was no coincidence or interference or anything like that. Sorry about that. But if so, if we're going to kind of do this again, so let's jump back to the two points. For the three points? Yeah. So. Well, let's, let's jump up here anyway to kind of show you where the math comes from. So again, in the two points, the math is easy. We've only got non-recombinants and one group of recombinants. So we do the recombinants over the total, and we get the frequency of recombination. What you're kind of doing in the three points is two separate two-point test crosses. We can look at the first two genes and the, the last two genes and do them separately. The only thing that's different is you've first got to find which uh, two recombinant phenotypes come from the same single crossover. So you've got to make sure you got the right ones first so you're not adding the wrong numbers. And we do that by observing their genotype. Once you've found the two pairs, the only thing that's different is instead of just doing recombinants over total, you have to do recombinants 
plus the double crossovers. And we explained that the double crossovers were the two least frequent. They'll always be the least frequent. I'll get to you in just a second. But we just do that twice. So we would find, since we have four recombinant offspring types, we find the two pairs that are related by a single crossover. We add, them to, we add one pair together plus the double crossovers and do that over the total. So that's like one separate two-point test cross. Then we do another separate one with the recombinations between the other two genes plus the double crossovers over the total. So you'll come up with two answers. You're not going to get just one answer like a two-point test cross. Um, so you'll, you would get the map distance between genes one and two. You'll also get the map distance between genes two and three. Does that make more sense, or do you need to clarify more? You got to tell me now. Your test is tomorrow, man. All right, what you got? Okay, so we jump back here and look up, up top here. So we start with two parents up top. One is uh, one in red, one in blue. Um, and we can get a single crossover happening between genes A and B. And that would mean that we would flip these two here. What used to be all recessive on the bottom and all dominant on the top has been changed because we had a crossover after A but before B. So we get genes B and C are flipped with each other. We could also get a single crossover between B and C. So everything after B and before C has been flipped. And in this case, just the C gene would be exchanged. That would be the single crossovers. And these two events occurred in the flies, which is where we got those two pairs of recombinant phenotypes. But you could get crossover happening twice during the same round of meiosis or mitosis. So it occurs first between A and B. So everything downstream is flipped, just like in here. So the top chromosome uh, would, or chromatid rather, would have a dominant A and then two recessives, B and C. And then it would happen again, as you can see here, between B and C. So after B and C have already been flipped, a flip happens again after B but before C. So the end effect is because we've had two crossovers at two different locations, the middle gene has been flipped once, the last gene has been flipped twice. So it's been corrected to where it was originally. The middle gene has been left recombined. So that allows us to find the double crossovers by finding which gene is, uh, is the only one that's different versus two genes that would be different. And that, when we combine it with the knowledge that the double crossovers are always the least frequent offspring, you have to know that in order for this to make sense, we can find the two least common offspring we combine that with our knowledge that a double crossover is always exchanges the middle gene. And when we put those together, we can say, well, this offspring here with five and this offspring here with three. We know they're the double crossovers between, because they're the least common. Organism with five has a dominant, a dominant, and a recessive. The other one has a recessive, a recessive, and a dominant. When we compare those to the parents, one parent's all dominant, one parent's all recessive, so the only one that the odd one out is the SS gene, because it's the one that's recessive between the dominants, and it's the one that's dominant between the recessives here. And so because we know that those are the double crossover offspring, and we know that the SS gene is the one that's been recombined, then when we put that all together, we know that SS is the only one that's been recombined. It's the middle gene. So that you would have to do first. She may make you put them in the right order. She may give it to you in the right order, but you should always check to make sure. Because if you don't make sure it's in the right order, you won't get the question right, OK? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Do we have more questions about this? Yes? On the left side, what, like, what's the following genome? Is there like an answer? Is there like a formula? That is the last slide. Yeah, there's like a right there. Yeah. So 14.6 uh, and 12.2, those that is the uh, distance, the map distance between the two genes. You get two figures here because we've got three genes, and we have a distance between genes one and two, and then the distance between genes two and three. So you'll get two numbers here. 
These could also be expressed as percent recombination or recombination frequency. A question might be worded. The answer would be the same because your math is done exactly the same. You still do uh, 110 over 755. So that's the number of recombinants plus double crossovers over the total. Except in saying, instead of saying 14.6 map units, you would say 14.6%. Same thing, and the last number, the 26.8, is looking at the distance. Instead of saying distance between 1 and 2, and then 2 and 3, you'd just be looking at the distance between 1 and 3, so the whole region. And that would be the distance between you know, 1 and 2 and 2 and 3 added together. Okay? Does that make sense? That's clear? Yes? 102. That is the sum of 50 and 52. So those are two offspring, recombinant offspring, and those recombinant genotypes came from the same single crossover event. So there was a crossover between ST and SS, and that produced two phenotypes that are uh, kind of related to each other. One had 50 offspring, one had 52. That adds up to 102. The eight is the number of double crossovers, five plus three. The 84 is from the other two recombinant types. They had a crossover between SS and E. And one was 43, the other was 41. And then again, we had the double crossovers. And 755 is the total number um, of all of the offspring, including the non-recombinants. OK? Any more? Very good. So that is the first half of the class. We get into the second half as we're mm, roughly halfway through this session. Um, into chapter eight, so chromosomal variation. Uh, this is very quick, only a couple things in here that I think are worth noting without getting into way too much detail. Because again, this is gonna be a condensed final. It's going to, she's gonna be leaving out a lot of the finer concepts for broad concepts. I think the best things to know, you should know what a duplication is. A duplication is what it says, uh, well, there's a couple types. I wouldn't worry about the types. But in a duplication, a region of DNA is duplicated onto the same chromosome. So in this example above, we have genes E and F are duplicated in the other chromosome you see below it. So now we have two copies of E and two copies of F. I wouldn't worry too much about the different types of duplications. Uh, it can lead to problems, so just like multiple X's can cause issues or multiple Y's can cause issues, extra copies of genes can cause problems with dosage. So we might get two or three times the amount of some protein, and that could be bad, or it could be good, usually bad. Uh, we could get a deletion, does what it says on the label. So if a duplication makes more of a couple genes, a deletion gets rid of that segment of DNA. Uh, that's obviously very bad, it's usually lethal. If it's uh, homozygous, if it's heterozygous, it could be a disease. A lot of disease comes from having only one copy of a very, very critical gene. That's a deletion. Uh, inversions, they go into a lot to deal with inversion loops. I wouldn't worry about that, but in an inversion, uh, we're simply taking a region of DNA. We're not making copies. We're not getting rid of it. We're just flipping it. So it's arranged reverse of how it used to be arranged. Again, it goes into more detail on what happens if we have a crossover between an inversion loop uh, and a regular chromosome. It can cause some issues, but I'm not going to address that. I think that's a little bit much for this test. Uh, yeah, that's the peri and paracentric inversion. And then the last type being a translocation. So if a duplication made copies of a certain region onto the same chromosome, a translocation isn't making copies, but it's switching regions from one chromosome to another chromosome. So E and F from chromosome 1 and Q and R from chromosome 2 are flipped onto each other's chromosomes. So we've moved it to a completely different molecule of DNA. Could be good, it could be bad. Just depends on how that chromosome is condensed. Uh, I wouldn't worry about Robertsonian translocations, and that's just telling you about chimps and humans. Last part from this that I think is important, aneuploidies. So we used that word earlier when we were talking about uh, errors with sex chromosome passing on. Uh, the, the more detailed explanation is here. But if we're talking about a ploidy event, anu meaning incorrect, ploidy meaning number of chromosomes, 
So an aneuploidy event is affecting a single chromosome. We get uh, I would I would know definitely know that an aneuploidy is an incorrect number of chromosomes. The one we've seen is trisomy. So we saw the trisomy tri for three means you've got instead of your normal diploid number of two, you've got three copies of a chromosome. We saw that with uh, a triple O X. We've heard of that with Down syndrome, three copies of a particular chromosome. Uh, the other instances, uh, pretty straightforward, mono for one, so we just have one copy. Uh, tetrasomy is four, and then nullosomy means zero, null for none. That's pretty much it. But if you remember that an aneuploidy is incorrect number of chromosomes. Don't confuse it with, and they occur from non-disjunction. I'm not going to talk about that. Um, if aneuploidy is one chromosome, a polyploidy is uh, uh, the entire uh, 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 genome. Uh, yes. So then uh, uh, polyploidy, we uh, completely replica replicate the entire uh, genome. So rather than just getting an extra X chromosome for an X triploidy, or trisomy, um, rather trisomy, we get an entire new set of chromosomes entirely. Humans don't do this. You die if that happens. Plants do. I wouldn't really worry about that. Just know that a polyploidy versus an aneuploidy, we're replicating, adding new copies or subtracting copies of the entire genome, all of the chromosomes. Any questions about that? So aneuploidy, it kind of sucks because the name changes uh, when you get into the examples. Hmm? Yeah, so aneuploidy, the examples are somies. So an aneuploid event results in a trisomy or a monosomy. Some for chromosome, that's easier to remember. But aneuploidy refers to that. So if you see aneuploidy, we're talking about one single chromosome. It's whether it has its normal two, or if it has an extra, or if it lost one. But if you see polyploidy, we're talking about the entire genome. So copying all 23 of our chromosomes and then getting an extra. If we got a tri uh, triploidy, we would have three copies of all 23 chromosomes versus having two copies. Uh, so if you see polyploidy or a triploid or tetraploid, we're talking about the whole genome versus somy for one single chromosome. Okay. Yes. I have no idea. I have no idea how she writes her test. Uh, I figure she may ask a question or two about it uh, because mitosis and meiosis are such a big deal here. Uh, if you're at least comfortable with the concept of what non-disjunction can do, we've kind of talked about it. It boils down to non-disjunction in people is going to result in aneuploidies. If you get a non-disjunction, some cells are going to have extra, some cells are going to lose one because we haven't split them apart the right way. That's about as deep as I get into it, okay? Any more questions? All right. Coming down to the wire here, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. Um, chapter 10, chemical nature. This we're going to blitz through real quick because everyone should know this really, really, really well. Uh, in fact, I. Yeah, it is on here. Before we go to 10, actually, we got to do 25 real quick. The fun part, the mathematics chapter. A um, couple important things in here. So the idea of a gene pool, the total, all the possible alleles and all the possible genotypes within a population. A population being a group of interbreeding, sexually reproducing individuals. So. A gene pool is only made up with the alleles of all these sexually reproducing individuals. If they're too old or if they're sterile, they don't matter. It's not in there. So a gene pool is all the possible alleles and genotypes. The whole concept of this chapter is that last bullet point, calculating the frequency of genotypes and alleles in a population. Um, this, I'm going to kind of go over quickly because if you haven't practiced the math here, hopefully you have because tonight's probably not going to be enough time to do it. Uh, we do this, we do all these kind of equations to see if a population is evolving. And evolution just means change in allele frequency over time. That's evolution. 
Um, we can calculate frequencies. That's this whole chapter. You can calculate genotype frequencies, and then you can calculate allele frequencies. So a genotype frequency would just be tracking the number or the frequency of homozygotes, homozygotic dominant or recessive, and then heterozygotes. That's fairly straightforward. It's very simple. We take the number of whichever genotype you're looking for. In this instance, the number of homozygotic dominants over the total number of individuals in the population. And bingo, you have your frequency of homozygous dominance. Same thing for all the others. Just substitute the numbers accordingly. Allelic frequencies are more involved. You have to remember that a homozygote has two copies of the same allele. A heterozygote has one copy of two alleles. So to calculate allele frequencies, we have to take double the number of homozygotic individuals for the allele that we're looking at. There are two alleles that we calculate separately. And then you add just one of the number of heterozygotes. They only have one copy. Then divide that by twice the total number of individuals, because every individual has two copies of uh, whichever allele, or, or let's say two alleles for the given loci. So we have to do a little bit extra math here. Um, and then you can do it again for, for dominant on one side, recessive on the other. Uh, and what we end up with is we, we call those P and Q. So P means the frequency of the dominant allele. It always means the frequency of the dominant allele. And Q always means the frequency of the recessive. Because there are only two options, dominant or recessive, the frequency of the dominant and the frequency of the recessive allele always add up to one. Uh, you can't have less or more than one if you only have two options. So that's the foundational piece of math there for this whole chapter. P plus Q equals one, knowing what P and Q are. That's a different way to do it. We don't worry about multiple. We don't care about x length. And then we get into Hardy-Weinberg's law, and that's a, giving us a tool to see if the allele frequencies are changing. And so we have five assumptions here that I feel like you should know. Should, it's pretty much the core of this whole chapter. Um, and we have five assumptions. The population's large. There's random mating, no mutation, no natural selection, and no gene flow. And gene flow is simply migration, movement, flow of genes between populations. So Hardy-Weinberg assumes these things. If we do the math and it doesn't come out right, it's because one of these things are broken. That's a whole separate class. That's evolutionary biology. She glazes over it pretty quick. Um, so Hardy-Weinberg uh, equation here, uh, P, P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared. Um, and that is uh, uh, the Hardy-Weinberg uh, equation. And it allows us to do a couple things. It allows us to solve for allele frequency if we have genotype frequencies uh, based on what you see in those brackets up above. So P squared is the value of P squared, but it's also the frequency of the homozygous dominant genotype. So you can figure out P squared by multiplying P times P if you have it, or if you know the genotype frequency, you can also substitute that for P squared and take the square root of it, and you've got the allele frequency. So you can do it one of two ways. It means two things, kind of. 2PQ, again, is the number, is the frequency of heterozygotes, or it's 2 times P plus Q, if you already have the P and Q values. Same thing for Q squared. And those all add up to 1, because you only have homozygote dominant, homozygote recessive, and heterozygotes. All of them together add up to 100% of the population, aka 1. That's the whole foundation of the thing. Um, this gets into why all of these things are why they are. I'm not going to get into them because that's a whole chapter and a bunch of lectures. But this explains the five assumptions of Hardy-Weinberg. Um, if you're a little unclear, maybe look back at them, but we're not going to get into them. Uh, except briefly genetic drift. So the reason I stop in to say this is genetic drift, that's under the whole pop large population assumption. So when we're saying assume the population is large, it's so we can assume that genetic drift doesn't happen. So we already know our genetic drift events, like population bottlenecks or the founder's effect, are examples of genetic drift. And they correspond with the assumption of large populations. Okay. And that's, again, 
finder effect, genetic bottleneck. Florida Panthers are an example. Don't worry about them. And there's homework problems. Any questions about population genetics? Yes. Yes. When a population is sufficiently large, we don't see genetic drift because the killing off of a small number of organisms basically has no effect. So the Hardy-Weinberg assumptions are assumptions that would be true to prevent allele changes. So if a population is small, we will be breaking Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium because genetic drift could happen easily. A small number of dead individuals from random chance could greatly affect the whole population. Okay? But again, that's a whole other course. Any more questions about chapter 25? Cool. Now we can get into chapter 10. All right, so the chemical nature of the gene, this was what I was saying earlier. Very, very foundational stuff that hopefully you guys know very well. Uh, we won't get into any of the history and all the stuff that's wrong because we don't care about it because it's wrong. I mean, I guess it's important, but whatever. All right, so we have three structures, a primary, a secondary, and a tertiary. Very similar to proteins, primary, secondary, and tertiary. So the primary, the actual sequence of nucleotides. Secondary. Uh, DNA, for as much as we care in this class, has one secondary structure, and that's a, a double helix. It's B DNA. The rest of them we don't care about. And then tertiary is modification of that double helix, which we know from further stuff later is chromatin, whether it's condensing or decondensing. That's tertiary structure, how we've packed up that double helix. Uh, and then we have the substituent units, the, the construction of a nucleotide. Every nucleotide has a five carbon sugar. We call it a pinto sugar. DNA has deoxyribose. RNA has ribose. There's a phosphate group hanging off that five, prime, or that five carbon sugar. And then there's a nitrogenous base also hanging off that five carbon sugar. The nitrogenous base being your A, T, G, or C. That's why we call it that. So there'll be uh, an adenine, a thymine, a guanine, and a cytosine. We see that up here. Don't memorize the structure. The only important parts here are that your A, looking at a five prime sugar in two ways, the left is ribose because it has a two prime uh, OH, an alcohol, you know, uh, a hydroxyl group, whatever you want to call it, and then deoxyribose does not. Both of them have that three prime hydroxyl group, which is important for a reason we cover in a second. Bases also don't memorize those. Don't worry about the structures. Uh, I would just know that there are purines and there are pyrimidines. There's two of each. And that purines are A and G, and pyrimidines are C and T and uracil. Uracil makes sense because we substitute T for U in prokaryotes. So if you remember that A and G are the purines, then you've got the pyrimidines already. All right, that's the phosphate. Most important part of this is that phosphates are negative, which makes sense when we talk about histones. Phosphates have a very, very, very strong negative charge. Um, and then this just shows you some pictograms of a DNA nucleotide versus an RNA nucleotide. Again, the only difference being the presence of uracil and the lack of a 2 prime hydroxyl. It actually only shows you the DNA. Never mind. When we make a chain of these, when we make a primary structure, we link the phosphate to the... Uh, the uh, three prime hydroxyl group of the, proceed, the preceding nucleotide. So it says down at the end, so the five prime phosphate, it's at the five prime sugar, that's why we call it the five prime end, links to the free three prime hydroxyl that's attached to the three prime carbon um, of the sugar before it. So we always synthesize, always, please remember, we always synthesize DNA or RNA in a five prime to three prime direction. As you see here, the five prime phosphate is bonding to the three prime hydroxyl of the nucleotide before it. They make a phosphodiester bond because there's an ester linkage through that oxygen. Um, there's two of those, and we call it a diester with a phosphate in the middle, phosphodiester. That makes the backbone, and then we can see in the middle of this piece of DNA, because it's double stranded, that we have hydrogen bonds that cause base pairing of the bases. So the backbone is covalent, phosphodiester. The, the base pairing is hydrogen, and we also see one strand is 5 to 3, the
the other strand is anti-parallel, it's five to three going the opposite direction. So that's DNA always is complementary. They base pair together and they're anti-parallel. They move in opposite directions. All right, RNA is single stranded, but otherwise the same thing. Uh, secondary structure we know is the double helix. So once they all base pair, they twist into this helical shape, just like that, that simple. Um, and then I just discussed hydrogen bonds, polarity, base pairing rules, hopefully you know these, A and T, C and G, uh, and when we're talking about RNA, A and U. That's B DNA, don't worry about it. Uh, RNA can form these little structures within itself, and don't worry about any of these additional ones. This uh, you covered, you just took an exam on it, DNA methylation, so I'm not going to cover that. And then again, she discusses the central dogma, which again, DNA stores information, it's transcribed, that transcript is translated, and we get a protein out of it. That's the central dogma. Uh, and then all you should know for this is that viruses can have double-stranded RNA. That's the only time we see double-stranded RNA. That's it. Any questions about chapter 10? No. None? None? All right. That's good. This is, again, stuff that's we've covered so many times you're sick of looking at it. 11 and we, woo, 15 minutes, all right. So chromosome structure, uh, chromatin, all that kind of stuff that's going on here. So let's look at this. Ba, 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 ba. So we already said bacterial chromosomes, very simple, circular. We're gonna get through this, get through that. That's the primary structure sequence of nucleotides, double helix, the tertiary, condensation. Uh, we have supercoiling, which is how both prokaryotes and eukaryotes condense their DNA. It's the only way that prokaryotes can condense their DNA. They can twist up the, the circular chromosome, but that's about it. Don't worry about positive and negative. Uh, don't worry about topoisomerases. So bacterial chromosomes, uh, we said before, they have one single chromosome. It's circular, and it can be supercoiled. Eukaryotic chromosomes obviously have a lot more going on. We have euchromatin and heterochromatin. Chromatin being DNA that's wrapped around proteins. And then euchromatin is decondensed or less condensed, however you want to think of it, and it is more accessible to transcription. Heterochromatin is always highly condensed. It is not transcribed, and it constitutes some things such as telomeres, and centromeres or an inactivated X. Those are all examples of heterochromatin. Don't worry about constitutive versus facultative. We have five histone proteins. A histone uh, 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 that DNA wraps around is, uh, is made up of the latter four, two of each. Um, so we have two copies of 2A, 2B, 3, and 4, and then H1 acts as a binding clip outside of the core histone. This just shows you how there are many levels of uh, chromatin uh, condensation. So nucleosomes or chromatosomes, uh, nucleosomes are DNA wrapped around a histone without the presence of H1 protein, which is that yellow portion you see at the bottom. So if that H1 protein is present, we call it a chromatosome. And then linker DNA is simply the DNA that's stretched between two histones two chromatosomes that's not wrapped up around a histone. Okay. Ba, 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 ba. Don't worry about chromatin puffs. Uh, this again, some very important things. So acetylation, methylation. Uh, we know from later chapters that acetylation of a histone uh, adds positive charges, or, or rather it masks the negative charges of the histone proteins, or the, and uh, we, we are the positive charges and we cause decondensation. If we reduce the positive charge of histones, we lessen the attraction between the positive and negative, the negative being the DNA, and we relax that DNA. If we remove acetyl groups, we increase the positive charge, we make it stick better to the negative DNA, and they bond really tight. We repress transcription. DNA methylation decreases transcription for reasons that it, we're not gonna talk about here. That's just an example. And then epigenetics, so epigenetics includes acetylation, methylation, phosphorylation was one exam for, that caught me, um, and all those different things. So epigenetics is simply the way we can change gene expression 
um, without modifying the DNA itself. So we don't do anything to change the sequence of the DNA. We simply do things on top of the DNA um, through tags, through acetyl groups or through methyl groups, so on and so forth. And then epigenetics can be inherited. It can be passed on to your, your kids. And then it can also help uh, uh, identify certain DNA. And then if a genome is all of your genes and all of your chromosomes, then your epigenome is all a categories or a, 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 a comprehensive list of all the epigenetic markers that an organism has. Okay? Not going to cover telomeres and centromeres. Any questions about that? Cool. Again, that's all stuff you guys are probably very familiar with. Chapter 12. Replication. All right, so all these models, just know the semi-conservative, because that's the one that's actually correct. The other two are wrong. So in, we know in semi-conservative, and skip this whole Messelson install thing, we know in semi-conservative, uh, if you look towards the far right, we start with one double helix strand with two originals. We replicate it, and each original gets paired off with a new strand. And then we replicate it again. You know, we never make old DNA. It's, it's each strand is going to be paired off with a new one. We get two new strands. Just know that semi-conservative is the right model. It's the way it happens. Uh, bacteria have one origin of replication. They have a small chromosome, and it happens pretty quick. They don't need multiple. Uh, eukaryotes have multiple origins of replication because we have gigantic chromosomes. It would take forever to replicate them if we didn't have multiple origins. Uh, don't worry about that. Uh, replication forks. When we have a bubble opened up like this, we have the forks going in opposite directions where the DNA is being opened up. So we have a template and a non-template strand. Uh, no, that's later, sorry. Uh, we have two strands that are opened up, both serving as a template for DNA replication. And that'll cause, at the end, two brand new uh, DNA double helices, or uh, helices at the end. We are synthesizing these in leading and lagging strands. So that's all based on the direction of synthesis as it relates to the replication fork. If synthesis of the strand is moving towards the replication fork, it's seamless. And as the DNA opens up, the strand just continues to be synthesized. If synthesis is occurring away from the fork, we get small fragments. We get Okazaki fragments because the synthesis has to wait for the fork to open up, place a new primer, and make a short strand again and again. So leading and lagging strands. Just as I said, it's discontinuous on the lagging strands. And so we get all those fragments that you can see. On both strands of DNA, we'll have leading and lagging, depending on which side of it you're looking at. All right. List of enzymes. You've got to know all of these. And hopefully we're familiar with them at this point. I won't uh, exhaustively get into them. But all of these you see here are absolutely critical to know. You should know their functions. We initiate, don't worry about that too much, uh, or the unwinding. Elongation, uh, simply the phrase we use as the strand is being opened. So after we've opened the DNA, all of those proteins, all those enzymes from before are assembled and ready. Elongation is simply the term for growing the strand of new DNA. And that occurs, of course, in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction, primarily with DNA polymerase 3 in eukaryotes. Prokaryotes only have one DNA polymerase. So in eukaryotes, DNA polymerase 3 synthesizes the strands. And then we know that DNA polymerase 1 comes back to remove RNA primers from the Okazaki fragments. DNA polymerase 1 with its 5' prime to 3' prime exonuclease to remove RNA primers. DNA polymerase 3 has a 3' prime to 5' prime exonuclease activity for proofreading, correcting mistakes. This is showing ligase sealing NICs. Again, something you should know already. Mismatch repair. So again, there's that proofreading. 3' prime to 5' prime. That's DNA polymerase 3, not 1. And some more stuff we don't need to worry about. More stuff we don't need to worry about. Any questions? DNA replication. Uh, I, in the interest of time and in the interest of condensing information for a final, I would say the only thing about telomeres is that they cap the end of chromosomes to prevent them from being degraded. That's all I'd worry about. So they're at the ends of the chromosomes, okay? 
chapter 13, transcription. So this I want to get into. So we relate that to the central dogma. After we replicate, we can transcribe to begin to express a gene. All right. More stuff we don't care about. So the overview here, um, we don't need a primer because we're making RNA, so we don't need an RNA primer for that. Uh, we always go three prime to five prime. We have a transcription bubble, but it doesn't have two replication forks. It moves in one direction. One strand will be the template, the one that's coding for the mRNA. The other strand doesn't really do anything in this instance. We don't make two strands of RNA. Uh, we don't have both DNA strands coding for it. One codes, one doesn't do anything. One's the template and one's the non-template, as it says here. A transcription unit, uh, it's just a, a bunch of DNA that encodes the RNA plus the other pieces that we need to do that. So you could call it a gene, a transcription unit and a gene, the same thing. It includes a promoter where, DNA, or where RNA polymerase is going to bind. It's going to include the coding region, and then it has a terminator, the sequence that tells transcription to stop. Okay? We have upstream and downstream describing um, directionality. Upstream being against the current of replication or uh, transcription, downstream being with the current of transcription. Uh, bacterial RNA polymerases, slightly different from eukaryotic RNA polymerases. In bacteria, they have a core enzyme that has to combine with a sigma factor, as you can see up top, in order to create a functional hollow enzyme. So when core polymerase and sigma factor have combined, they make a hollow enzyme that's functional. Uh, there is a consensus sequence within the promoter for both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. They're different sequences. They both serve the purpose of uh, being a binding location for RNA polymerase. In prokaryotes, we call it the Prydnow box within the promoter. We elongate simply by adding new nucleotides with RNA polymerase, and then we terminate in prokaryotes with rho independent and rho dependent. I'm not going to get into too much detail here. Um, it's probably a little bit too much for the test. So eukaryotes, here's four. We only care about RNA polymerase two. The rest of them she never taught you and you don't need to worry about. So instead of a core, promote, or a core uh, enzyme and a sigma factor, eukaryotes assemble a basal transcriptional apparatus and that consists of RNA polymerase II plus a bunch of transcription factors. You don't need to know any of those transcription factors. But there's a lot more than just sigma, and they all serve to allow polymerase to bind to the promoter. And so there's also a uh, sequence, a consensus sequence within the promoter. We call the ta, -ta box here instead of the Prydnow. Eukaryotes have both a core promoter and a regulatory promoter. Um, that is in the next slide. So their promoter is made up of two parts. The core promoter binds polymerase just like in prokaryotes. The regulatory promoter can bind other elements that increase or decrease the rate of transcription. We initiate once we've got all of those factors together. Again, you don't need to know any of those. We elongate, and then we terminate using RAT1 protein. I want to worry about how RAT1 functions, but if you know that eukaryotic transcription involves a protein called RAT1. There's a comparison. We don't care about archaea, and there's homework problems. Any questions about transcription? All right. So it's coming up on time. I think I'll be able to eke out uh, definitely this one, and maybe we'll get some translation before you guys have to go. So if we jump into the last section here, only a little bit going on here how we process the RNA before it's translated. So this is the, if we're looking at exam four material, this is what we call post-transcriptional kind of area here. We can regulate that, but this is before translation. Uh, so we have this big strand of RNA, mRNA that's been made from transcription. And what can we do with it? So in eukaryotes, you see this term down here, pre-mRNAs. Yeah, I know it's time. Um, we have pre-mRNAs, so there's obviously going to be something that's going to happen from there. So all mRNAs are going to have a 5' prime and a 3' prime untranslated region called the UTR. They're regions that have been put into the mRNA but are not going to be uh, uh, coded in translation for an amino acid, for a codon. 
It includes the Shine Delgarno sequence and prokaryotes within the promoter. Um, eukaryotes have a five prime cap and a three prime poly A tail. Eukaryotes also uh, have introns and exons, so we, we have to remove some introns. The five prime cap, don't worry too much about it, just know it's there at the five prime end and it caps it off. Don't worry about that mechanism. And the poly A tail does what it says on the label. It's a bunch of adenines tacked on to the three prime end of an mRNA and eukaryotes only. So while prokaryotes have a five prime and three prime UTR, they do not have a five prime cap. They don't have a poly A tail, okay? Introns, eukaryotes only, we splice them out. Don't worry too much about spliceosomes. Alternative splicing, so sometimes eukaryotes will cut out certain exons, and that allows multiple gene products to be made from the same gene. So by selectively removing certain exons along with the introns, we can make different gene products from the same gene. Don't worry about the process of, of cleavage or anything like that. tRNAs, they hold an amino acid for translation. Each amino acid has its own specific tRNA. So humans, we have over 20 tRNAs for the uh, many different amino acids that we need to function. And then the only parts of this you should know is we have at one end of a tRNA, we have an amino acid attachment site, and at the other end, at the very bottom, we have a region that will have an anticodon that's specific and will recognize the codon uh, with one of the mRNA to recognize the right amino acid. And that's about all it comes down to. Don't worry about the CCA. And then a ribosome, a small subunit, a large subunit, that's in both eukaryotes and prokaryotes. Don't worry about processing our RNAs. Any questions about modifying RNAs? mRNAs. No? All right, so before I get into the last part, I'm going to do it as I'm talking to you guys. Uh, I got to pass this dealie out. You guys have got to do this. It's a short kind of evaluation about me. Your name's not on here. I'm not going to see these. Say whatever you want. I do not particularly care. Well, I do care. I was hoping this is useful to you guys. At the very top, those two numbers, please bubble in 70. Um, and then this is just going to the... Uh, my bosses and all those guys to kind of tell us how we're doing. So just like normal, pass them down. If you got any extras, I'm going to need them because there's a lot more of you guys than I thought. Here you go. Uh, hey, Aaron, could you do me a favor? Downstairs at the desk right by the Cafe Bucello is the Sark table. Could you ask them to give you about 30 more copies of the evaluation form and bring it back up for me? Thank you. All right, so I got someone going to get some more. Hey, quiet, please, quiet. Uh, and I'll pass those out to you guys. Um, I just can get you to, to do those before we go. While you're doing that, again, if you got any extras, please just pass them down in the next row or whatever. And I'm going to cover the last chapter, 15, quickly before we go. 70, 70, please. And then when you're done with those, uh, you can just stack them on like this last table as you're leaving. Okay, I'd appreciate it. So chapter 15, why you guys are filling that out. Uh, we start with an introduction to amino acids. You should know just this generic model of an amino acid. We've got an N-terminal, we've got a carbon in the middle, and then we've got a carboxylic group at the end, the C-terminal, and then there's a side chain. And the side chain is what makes all the amino acids different. Everything else is always the same. We join those together with a peptide bond to make a polypeptide, aka a protein. We bond the carboxy terminus to the next amino acid's in terminus. We call that a peptide bond. So translating, uh, we will read the codon that's on the mRNA, a sequence of three uh, 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 RNA bases. And it will be recognized by the anticodon, the complementary RNA sequence, in a tRNA. So when they base pair together, that ensures that we have the right amino acid being inserted. That's translation. We've got a bunch of different codons. Some of them code for the same amino acid. Some of them code for different ones. But they're redundant for the most cases. And the only one you should know by heart is AUG, and that's the start codon. It codes for methionine and eukaryotes, MET, M-E-T. It codes for F-MET and prokaryotes. So prokaryotes start with F-MET, eukaryotes start with MET. 
That's just showing the base pairing. So we start with charging. That's just loading the amino acid onto a tRNA. You don't need to worry about how that happens. Uh, you don't need to know that enzyme either. We initiate, and we have initiation in bacteria, and we have initiation in eukaryotes. In bacteria, don't worry about IF3, but the small ribosomal subunit recognizes the shine delgarno sequence, and it recognizes that because it's got the start codon within uh, or right next to, rather, the shine delgarno sequence. So the ribosome sees the shine delgarno, and it knows that the start codon will be right next to it. It locates it where it needs to be um, for translation to start correctly. I'll get this. Thanks, Aaron. You guys got some already. You guys got them? Here. You guys got some? Just hang on to them. Here's some. Here's some, and there's some. Cool. If anybody doesn't have them, there's huge stacks on the other side. All right, so if bacteria, the small ribosomal subunit recognizes Shine Delgarno, and that places it next to the start codon, which will be F-met, eukaryotes are slightly different. So we have the Shine Delgarno sequence, binds the small ribosomal subunit. We bring in the tRNA for F-met, which is the start codon. And once that's all together, the large subunit binds. Similar but different in eukaryotes. So we have the five prime cap is what the small ribosomal subunit will bind to. And once it binds the five prime cap, it scans down the length of the mRNA until it finds the COSAC sequence. So not the Shine Delgarno, but the COSAC. Within the COSAC sequence is the start codon. So AUG is in the middle of the COSAC sequence. So it scans, it finds COSAC, and it knows that the start codon is in the middle. And again, so where prokaryotes use F-met, eukaryotes use methionine, so the small ribosomal unit will bind to the five prime cap, then the MET tRNA will bind, and then the large ribosomal subunit will bind on top of that. In both cases, prokaryotes and eukaryotes, the large ribosomal subunit has three sites that bind tRNAs. We've got an A, a P, and an E site. If you can remember A for arrive, P for push and E for exit. Just don't remember E for entry. We're going to mess up. Um, so a fresh tRNA comes into the A site. When we move the codon to the, or the ribosome to the next codon, that tRNA is moved to the P site. And then we move to the, the third codon. The amino acid has been stripped away from the, P si or from the tRNA. It's been added to the polypeptide and it's ejected through the E site. It exits through the E site. That's in prokaryotes and eukaryotes. That's elongation. Don't worry about these factors up here. Don't worry about translocation. And then when we terminate the last part here, eventually it reads a stop codon, which you don't need to memorize. And when a uh, ribosome reaches a stop codon, the ribosome breaks away, the polypeptide releases, and we stop translation. Did we have any questions about that? No. Yes. So it's just like it reads any other codon. Uh, so we shift down to the next group of three RNA bases. And the stop codon specifically, if you're interested, it doesn't code for any tRNA. So a tRNA won't enter. And due to reasons you don't need to know, when a tRNA doesn't enter the A site, it causes the ribosome to just break apart. Yeah, so the ribosome, just like it recognizes every other codon, it's, it's the stop codon it recognizes as a sequence that says stop. And it breaks apart, and uh, the mRNA floats away, the ribosome floats away, and the polypeptide floats away. Okay? So there's five more minutes. Please finish that thing up. Um, and then if you like, want to pass them down, and I'll collect them, or again, if you just want to leave, leave them on the back table. Are there any questions about anything else in the next five minutes? So try and keep it quiet, please, so I can hear everybody. Pardon? So, so a repressor is going to stop an operon from being transcribed. So a repressor just stops transcription in prokaryotes. It represses transcription. A co-repressor 
um, either activate or it uh, activates a repressor. So an inducer will turn off a repressor. A co-repressor activates a repressor. Okay. Yes. And then, like, you got really fast, and I was like, I could not follow. Yeah, sorry about that. The time started counting down. Um, it is all, I did this all off of her PowerPoints. So any of you don't see, they're in the PowerPoints. Um, but again, it's kind of condensed. So everything from the material isn't going to be in there. But if you look back through your PowerPoints tonight before you exam tomorrow, you should be able to fill in all of these. Okay. Yes. Why do I turn this in? To, to me. Oh. Thank you. Yes, so everything uh, off that study guide I took straight from the PowerPoints. Thank okay. Thanks. Thanks. Question. Mm -hmm. For the meiosis one, stage one, this is homologous pair, right? Yes, so we have the homologous pairs or homologs, however you want to say it. Okay, but will you say they're sister chromatids? So before the homologous pair. Before crossing over. Yes, so each of the two homologous chromosomes is also made of two sister chromatids. Okay. So first we split the pair of chromosomes. And then in meiosis 2, we split the chromatids apart. Okay? Did I do this right? I don't know. Yeah, 70. Yeah, you're good. I saw on the thing, it says 10 o'clock is the exam? Yes, 10 o'clock tomorrow. It's 30 minutes early. Okay. Gotcha. Same room. Same room. Have you seen this? This is called Zai. Don't worry about that. That's more in depth than you need to know. Uh, the, her test, uh, she told me to, to, to base this off of broad concepts. So don't worry about the small ones. Oh, you're with Sotero. I don't know about him. Yeah, if he tests you guys a little bit deeper. Um, in fact, I, I don't even really know the term dyads. Oh, another thing is they say that Thank you. here, if I say this is 2N, it's mm -hmm. an N, right? Yes, because in the first round, meiosis 1, thanks, Samantha, we split the homologous pairs. We've then made it haploid instead of diploid. Because now each cell only has one copy of each chromosome. You'll call it diploid and then haploid. Haploid. And then haploid. Haploid again, yeah. So it's still haploid because when the sister chromatids are joined, we still consider them one chromosome. Okay. All right? Uh, for those that you skipped over, like, is that like other slides that you think that? Everything I skipped over, I think it's stuff that won't be on there. I have no way of knowing what's going to be on. Okay. 